This is the test. What is that great name? Jesus. Amen and amen. Name above all names. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you today. Here we are at the end of spring break. Good to see some folks out. We still got some folks traveling and vacating the premises, but we're glad that you're back on the premises. Amen. We've been in a, uh, I told Kathy, I said, next time I'm preaching what I consider to be this important, a series of messages, make sure we don't do it around spring break. Because <laughs> I think these are very, very important messages for our church. And if you had to be out of town for the last Sunday or so, remember we post these messages back up on the internet. And now we're pretty much getting them the following week immediately. So uh, if you missed a Sunday, go back and check it out. Because these are really important matters as we talk about ministry matters. I'll probably preach this Sunday maybe one or two more as the, as the Lord gives direction in this, in this series. But these are important sermons as we've talked about every believer. That's you and me. If you know Jesus Christ, you are a minister of the Lord. You have a ministry unto the Lord. You have a ministry that is, is, is we've been looking a lot at 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 where he says we're coming unto Christ and we're coming unto the chief cornerstone. There's this ministry that you have of, of worship. And the Bible says you're a priest unto the Lord and you're, you're a royal priesthood. It means there's a ministry that we have in representation of ourselves before the Lord, but also for the Lord. Last week we, we, we dealt with the issue that there's an inward ministry within the fellowship. This week we'll look at a little bit of the outward ministry. In fact, for two Sundays, we specifically looked at a sermon series that we titled, subtitled in the series in part three and four is, Who Do You Think You Are? And uh, it's, it's important that you know who you are. Because once you settle who you really are, those issues about inferiority and insecurity and the lack of boldness and courage that you need as a Christian in the world we live in, they seem to start dissipating when you have a clear understanding of who you really are and you get your identity straight. I believe that victory... And the, key to, and the secret key to victory, so many don't understand, is really knowing who you are. When you realize who you are, man, I'll put it this way, the devil doesn't want you to realize that, who you really are in Christ, because it will change the way you live your life. Because when you get down in here and in here, what God has really done and what he's really made you, it begins to affect a lot of different areas. So one of the greatest things you can do in your spiritual life is understand who you are. So we talked about that, who do you think you are? And we dealt with in that regard about our, our priesthood ministry before the Lord and our representation before the Lord. And then last week we talked about who do you think uh, we are? And we dealt with not just you, but now dealing with we are. And when we talk about who we are, that's that understanding as the body of Christ. And a lot of people, you know, they don't, they, they got that part, you know, where we talk about they understand who they are individually, but they haven't understood the big picture. And we talked about what that produces in our spiritual life is a type of narcissism where we, just, we can sit around and we can celebrate all that the Lord has done for me and what God has given me and what I can, I can get from the Lord and receive from the Lord and all those elements are involved with me and just Jesus and all the blessings of God. But if, if my world stops there and just centers around what God's done for me, then I've certainly missed the mark according to the New Testament. In fact, it tells us very clearly that we're, we're part of a living organism, the body of Christ. And that now that what I am is not only just, you know, something God's done in me, it affects my relationship to everybody and every other believer within the body of Christ. So who do you think we are? We need to understand who that is. And then today I want to talk about who you think they are. Speaking of the people who don't know Christ, the people that we... Put it this way, you should know because there used to be one, amen? Uh, and God's done a change in your life. So as we look at today's message, we, we look a little bit about who do, you, who do you think they are? Now, let me just rehearse something very quickly. I've made this quick list, and these are just some verses out of chapter 1 and chapter 2 where, I mean, the apostle Peter is just driving this home, really the Holy Spirit through Peter, to make this important part that you need to understand who you are. And he talks about, in verse 1 of chapter 1, aliens. In verse 2, we're sanctified, we're sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. In verse 3, we're born again. Verse 5, thereby we are protected by the power of God. In verse 14, we're children of God. Repeats it in verse 17. Verse 18, we are redeemed by the blood. Goes into chapter 2, verse 4, living stones. Verse 5, being built up, we're a spiritual house. Verse 5, we're a priesthood. Verse 9, we're a chosen race. Verse 9, it says we're a holy nation. Verse 10, we're God's own possession, and there's really two here, and his own people. Verse 11, we are the beloved of God. Verse 11, we're aliens. Verse 11, we're, we're strangers. That's who we are. This is just kind of a, 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 to me personally, when I look at this and I see so many personal identifications to who you and I are in Christ, 
uh, and it just keeps pounding and pounding and pounding at this, all these verses in about two and a half chapters, it's important that we slow down and note that's what God has done within us. These are not things we hope to be. These are not things we're striving for. These are what God has already done. And you need, to, you need to get a grip on that. It doesn't need to be something that's head knowledge. It needs to be transformed into heart knowledge. It needs to be radicalized within your spirit. This is who I am. Why in the world should I act any other way? Why in the world would I live any other way? This is who I are. Amen. But he didn't stop there. He said, now how that affects others who are the same as you and your accountability to them, as we talked about last week. But then he tells us what we were, but then he talks about who are they. And what's my responsibility to the day? And to the day. By that I mean those who are without Christ now, those who are, haven't been in, and experienced this particular change. Who are they? And what, what, what's my accountability to who they are? Well, let me give you a brief description from 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 of what he says about him. He tells us, we've been born again, they haven't been. We've experienced a resurrection, they haven't. So what's that make them? They're dead. Paul wrote this in Ephesians. He said, you are dead. He said, Brother Joe, I'm alive. No, if you don't know Jesus, you're dead. You're, you're alive physically, but soulishly, spiritually, you know, you just don't have real life within you. Christ alone brings life. If any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. You are no longer dead in trespasses and sin. You've been regenerated. You've been brought to life. But every person who doesn't know Jesus Christ, this is an expression that we need to realize they're dead. They need a resurrection. We were dead. We had a resurrection. So we need to understand who they are. But he also describes them as deceived in 1 Peter 1, 14. And verse 18, when he says to them here, he said, listen, you, you're obedient children. So don't be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in ignorance. Underline that. Verse 18, knowing you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from, underline this, your futile way of life you inherited from your forefathers. So what's he saying about these people? This is where we used to be before we met Christ. We lived in deception. We were disobedient. We didn't respond to God's spirit in our life. We didn't, re, we, we didn't, we didn't relate to God's word and, and his will in life. We, we rejected that. Why? Because we were living in futility. I think that, that Christians need to come back to an understanding that those people that we know, family members, co-workers, or just people on the everyday paths of life who don't know Christ, those people, they fall into this category. They're, they're living in futility. And they're living in a, in a deception, that, an ignorance, the Bible calls it. And what are they ignorant of? They're ignorant of the power of God. They're ignorant of the grace of God. They're ignorant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, and such were you. So he's telling us very clearly what we become again, but also in what we see here is a clear picture of who are those who are without Christ. And in fact, he calls them deniers in verse 7 of chapter 2. This precious value, this, this gospel, redemption, salvation, new life, is for you who believe. But if they disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. They, they are, they're deniers. What, what keeps a person from eternity in heaven? What keeps a person from spiritual life? They deny the cross. They deny Jesus Christ. It all really gets down to, to that, you know, what are you going to do with Jesus? It, it's like Pilate, you know, as he's standing there before Christ prior to the crucifixion, and he's washing his hands, you know, like he doesn't want anything to do with this decision. He's not going to make a choice. He's not going to make a decision. And because he doesn't, you know, he thinks he's just neutral. But you're never neutral. You know, Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. All right? So there's no neutrality here. And he's making it clear that if they're without Christ, they've rejected the, the only hope they, they would ever have. So they, they are deniers, but he also calls them disobedient. He said, it is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. That's Jesus. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. In fact, most of them don't care about the word. They have no knowledge of the word. They don't care about the word. They're not important. The word's not important in their life. And it'll never become important in their life, ever, until we shine light, until we bring message, until we share gospel, until we be a witness. It, that's the, the way that people will stay. Unless we respond to the call of God on our life, they're, they're disobedient to the word. He also says it very clearly here in, in, in the same verse, the latter part. He says, and to this doom they were also appointed. 
Now, this is not saying for my Calvinist friends and those who are hardcore predestinationalists and, you know, in that mindset that God has said, all right, these are the unbelievers, and therefore I have chosen this, 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 and I've chosen them to be unbelievers, and now because they're unbelievers, I've, I've chosen them for doom. That's the way some people read that. But what God has said, what Jesus said, he that believeth is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. In other words, there's two roads, Jesus said. There's a broad road and a narrow road. And if you're on this road, it has already been foreordained that if you follow that road, you're going to end up in, in trouble. That's hell and damnation. That's the destiny of that road. But if you choose, that's what God has preordained. You reject Jesus, you die. There's no hope. It's the only way of salvation. All right? But if you accept Jesus, then the, you have been preordained for heaven. Everybody on that, who makes that decision, whosoever will. Now, I believe that God works in our heart. I believe that God brings his Holy Spirit. I believe that God brings conviction. And I believe because that we are the elect of God when we choose to receive Jesus. There's such a fine balance that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But the idea behind this is if, you're get, if you make the choice against Christ and if you reject the stone and you stumble there instead of believe there, then there's no real hope for you. And we need to get this back in the heart and the mind of every believer that people without Christ don't have a hope. That people without Christ are not going to make it into heaven. Now, I know I've, I've watched the media try to trick preachers and, and take well-known preachers, and, and I've watched preachers who didn't want to honestly come out because they're afraid it might offend somebody, kind of go around this like, and say stuff like, well, I'm not God, and you know I, I know that God knows everybody's heart, and God's the judge. No, the Bible says we don't have to guess. We know very clearly what, what's going to happen to a man who receives Jesus and what's going to happen to a person who rejects Jesus. Jesus made it very clear, hey, it's either, it's either condemnation in our life. Amen? So never apologize for that. All right? Don't, don't let the world fit you in their little politically correct box so that you have to fit their formula and say, well, you know, that's just up to the Lord. No, that's just up to the Lord, and the Lord's already made his mind up. All right? And he shows us, he says, we have the mind of Christ because we have the word of God. So these people, there's, not, there's no hope. But not only that, the Bible makes it clear in 2 Peter verses 2, 9, and 10 we're the chosen race, we're the royal priesthood, we're the holy nation, we're a people for God's own possession so we can proclaim the excellency who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were not a people who went on to say, but now you're the people of God. You didn't receive mercy, but now you have mercy. What's he doing? He's given us this clear, accurate picture that anybody without Jesus Christ is living this directionless life. Why? Because they're in darkness. You can't see when you're in darkness. That's why a lot of people tell you when you try to share the gospel, with, oh, I just don't see it. They don't. And that's why you have to be patient and you have to be gentle and you have to be loving and you have to be really concerned about them so that they can come to the place where the Holy Spirit begins to bear the truth to their heart and the lights begin to come on. I, I remember in that state of conviction in my heart and life where the Lord would bring me to those places where I'm kind of... The lights are coming on, and I, I, didn't, want to re, I didn't want to receive Jesus. I, I re, maybe you can relate to that. Where there's points where you, you reject it because you, still wanted, you thought there was some value in living the way you used to live. And God had to bring you to the end of yourself to say, hey, there's no value in living that kind of life. There's value in giving your life to Jesus. So people without Christ, the Bible tells us, that, I mean, they're doomed. They're, they're disillusioned. They're, they're deceived, and they're living in darkness. And we have all these these. these, these Clear, clear words about what we were and what they are. So who do I think they are? I think they're lost without Christ. But I not only, I not only think that if I follow this passage and these, this chapter 1 and 2 as we've been studying clearly, then I realize not only are they that, but now that I am what I am, I have responsibility to not only you, to not only my father, but to a lost world. Because he goes on to tell us we have this outward ministry to a lost world. And he tells us in verse 9 when he puts it this way, you are a chosen race, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Listen to this. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, just underline that last phrase. What are we here? He says, you are here to proclaim the excellencies of him. Him who? Jesus. Him who? The Father. What have I been called to do? Why have I been changed? Why am I all these new things? Because I have a message to those people who I used to be one of. 
when I was not a people, when I was not a possession, when I was not a royal priesthood, when I was not a holy nation. He says, now you've been called out of that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to shine and proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you. Now the word proclaim, this, this particular word in the Greek language is only used in this particular passage. There's lots of other Bible verses that talk about preaching and speaking and testifying. But this is a very unique word. And it literally means it's your job to publish. Let me put it in a more contemporary phrasing, to advertise. You are God's advertisement for what it means to be a chosen people. You are God's advertisement. You're the one who publishes what it's like to belong to Jesus Christ, to have your life changed. He says, you're here to publish. Well, what am I here to advertise? And what am, what am I here to publish? Well, he tells you. I'm so glad you asked. He says that you may proclaim the, what's the next word? The excellencies. Now, a lot of people think, well, excellencies, that's talking about his royal attributes. That's talking about his great, uh, you know, uh, royal, you know, uh, qualities, that those intrinsic, wonderful things about his royalty. That's not what this word means. This word, when it talks about excellencies, is the Greek word eretes, A-R-E-T-A-S is the way we'd spell it in the English. And it means that we are here to proclaim, and here's what this word means, someone's ability to perform powerful and heroic deeds. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to tell a lost world that God can do what nobody else can. The message is simple. God is able. What am I proclaiming? God is able. What's your life like right now? God can fix that. God can change that. What, what, what's your home life? God can do that. God will do it if you'll let him. God can do that. God can do heroic things. God can deliver. God can save. God can raise up. God can change. God can heal. God can work. If he doesn't heal you, he'll give you grace in the midst of it. But God can. And listen, there's so many verses throughout Scripture that just talk about the wonderful power of God. God is able. That's our message. Because of the gospel, God's able to do things that you didn't think could be done. God is able to do something in you that you didn't think was possible. God's able to do something, well, here's the way Paul put it, that is exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can think or ask. God's able. That's the message. Why are we so timid about sharing what God's able? I mean, the scripture is so distinctly filled, you know, with this, with this powerful, awesome God. And what God is saying here is that you and I have this incredible privilege of telling the world that Jesus Christ has the power to change every aspect of their life if they'll let him do it. I mean, if you just, let me give you a list. You want to write these down right fast. In Acts 1.8. In Acts 2, 22, in Acts 4, 20, in Acts 5, 31, and verse 32, in Revelation 15, 9, Psalm 66, verse 3, and verse 5, and chapter 16, uh, verse 16, also in chapter 71, verse 17, and chapter 73, verse 28, chapter 77, verse 12, 14, Psalms 104, verse 24, Psalms 107, verse 22, Psalms 111, 6 through 7, Psalms 118, 17, also if you look at Psalms 119, verse 46, Psalm 145, verse 4, John 5, 36, John 10, 25, and on and on and on. hope you get the idea of what I'm saying. It'll be on recording. But let me just say that. Just open your Bible. Anywhere you're going to find out God is able. God is able. But what about God is able? But you don't know. God is able. But this situation, God is able. But he, but does she, but they, hey, God is able. That's the message we share. The world, world needs that message about the great grace and ability of God. And the thing about before he introduces this, halfway through the second chapter, he's told us all these things that God has done, been able to do in you to change you into that long list we looked at. So if anybody under, should understand the ability of God, it ought to be us. God, look back at your life. How many times has God delivered? How many times has God manifested his, these amazing heroic acts and performed powerful things in your life? This is who we've been called. This is what we're called to do. We're supposed to be. I'm here. You're here to tell the world God's able. We tell him he's the hope. 
He's, he's, he's your life. He's your peace. He's your victory. He can be your joy. In Acts 1.8, there's, there's, that, there's that great verse in 1.8 where, where the Lord's preparing the, the, the disciples to let them know something supernatural is getting ready to happen. You see, what is it? The church is going to be born on the day of Pentecost. It's what Pentecost is about, the birth of the church. All right? And remember, they were all in one accord, in one place, and the, and the Lord's speaking to them. This is prior to the Holy Spirit, and he says, hey, here, but, well, here's what's going to happen. He says, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and you're going to receive power when he comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, the whole world. You're going you're gonna to change the world. Now, that verse is the same for every one of us, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, what happens? Well, Brother Joe, I, we, we, we get excited. We jump the pews. We speak in tongues. We run around in circles. No. All right? I don't care. You know, you, you can get over and bark against the wall. I don't care. But if it doesn't lead to this, being a witness, you didn't get the Holy Spirit. I don't care what you walked away with. I don't care if you got a halo that shines and you can see it in the mirror. If you did not receive the Holy Spirit, if you're not a witness, something happens when a person gives their life to Jesus. You know what it is? The Bible says that you are taken and you are baptized into the body of Christ. You become one in that moment of salvation, one with God through Jesus Christ by the means of the operating power of the Holy Spirit who comes into you. You say, Brother Joe, when does that happen? Now, there's a lot of sermons on that by a lot of different people, but the Bible makes it clear in Romans, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. So I believe it very clearly happens, the transformation happens, that you're born of the Spirit, the moment of salvation. You can't be born of the Spirit without the Spirit. And we say, Brother Joe, that one verse says, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. Uh, I have the Spirit of Jesus, but I don't have the Holy Spirit. Let's not be stupid. Now, I know preachers who preach that. And that's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, I've heard preachers get up and say, well, you know, Brother Joe, Jesus had a Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has a spirit, and the Father has a spirit. In fact, it's Benny Hinn, and I quote, well, really, each person in the Godhead has their own trinity. Let me tell you, that's the stupidest thing you'll ever hear, and the stupidest thing I've said all day. <laughs> There's no place in Scripture for that. There's no place in the Word of God for that. There's no clarity that's ever even alluded that there's nine in the Godhead. Because it's not so. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. So if you don't have that spirit, you're not saved. So you get that spirit. When you get saved, you're born anew. Now, it's another thing here to let that Holy Spirit, who now lives in you, fill you daily. The Bible tells in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that we're saved by faith, right? But it also goes on to tell us later in Ephesians, hey, now we're to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a daily surrender of your heart and life. And what happens when you're being daily filled with the Holy Spirit? You're going to talk about Jesus. That's simply what it says. You're going to be my witnesses. The Spirit of God is going to provide you a unique ability. And this is why he's talking about all these changes in chapter 1 and 2. You have all these changes you've gone through. You have to believe it. You need to look at that list again and say, that's me, that's me, that's me. I am this, I am this. God did this, God did this. This is who I am, this is what I am. And, this, and as a result of that, I'm changed. And I am readily, completely, thoroughly equipped to do whatever God wants me to do, to say whatever God wants me to say, to go wherever God wants me to go, and to do whatever I'm called to do. Why? Because I have the Holy Spirit living in me. He says, because of this, you've had all these changes. Why, why have I done this? He tells us very clearly. You're a race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that you may now proclaim God is able. God's able. And in fact, the rest of this chapter, he, he kind of deals with this in, in some various and unique ways. L let me give it to you in a nutshell, all right? How do you accomplish this, this ministry of, of being this light to the world and this salt to the earth and this gospel speaker to the world around you? First of all, understand who you are. You've got to go back and look at that. That's who you are. Not just say, oh, I praise the Lord. I'm a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. I'll make some notes in my Bible. Royal priesthood. Circle that. P-T-L. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no. It's time to stop and let that sink in. 
God's done something incredible in me. I have access to God. I can walk in His presence. I can talk. I don't need somebody in between here on the planet, between me and God, to get my prayers heard. I don't have to confess my sins to any individual. I go straight to the, to the source. I'm dealing straight with Jesus and with the Father. I have access. I'm his, and God's called me. And you follow this list. You've got to understand who you are. Now, I've preached on that two weeks in a row. Hopefully, it's starting to sink in. If you're listening, if you have ears to hear, it's starting to get into the, to the grain of your brain. Amen? The second thing is, if I believe that and if I receive that, then it's time to stand. It's time to quit looking for excuses. It's time to quit bailing out. Time to quit apologizing for being a believer. Some of you folks stand before the world and you act like you want to apologize. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a Christian. I can't go along now. I'm sorry. I got saved. You're the one on the rock. You're the one on the foundation stone. You're the one with God living in you. Verse 9, when he says, you, so you may proclaim the excellencies who called you out of darkness into the light. I think this, this is an attitude that I don't take a quiet corner somewhere and wait for someone to call on me. I'm not sitting around waiting for somebody to walk up to me and say, oh, man, you're a Christian, aren't you? I saw a Bible in your car. Looked like I've been there a while, but you're a Christian, right? You're going to flake up at the edges of the book. Maybe you could please, 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 please tell me I can get saved. I need to know Jesus. No, that's not what we're waiting for. Kind of hiding behind our little shield, hoping somebody might come. We can win somebody to Jesus. No, we're, we're, we've taken a different kind of posture. It's not a defensive. It's, it's a, we're, we're on the offense now, right? We're moving forward. We're not waiting for somebody. We're not acting like a bunch of cowards and wimps, you know. You know, the old time preacher called penny wasted Christians. We're not that, we don't fall in that category. All right? That, that's not who we're, we're, we, you know, we're not starting the Wimps for Jesus Club. We're serious about our walk with God. We, and people say, well, you don't be pushy. Hey, the world's pushy. Hey, you know, those guys in the world have, you know, have no problem whatsoever being arrogant and pushy and shoving everything down our throats at every opportunity, everything that's wicked, everything that's contrary to the gospel, everything that's contrary to God comes across the waves of our TVs and movies and radios 24 hours a day seeking to shove it down our throat and radically transform our way of life. But I ain't putting up with it. I'm not going to be entertained by it. We need to stand up and say, we're not afraid of you. Because we are mighty in Christ. And we don't have to apologize for our lack of political correctness. But the world's pushy. The LGBTQ XYZ community. They're pushy. And I always love how they're always talking about tolerance. But boy, you better raise your voice and say, I don't believe that. Then there's no more tolerance. Right? It's amazing how tolerant the church can be and Christians can be, but anybody that, you know, would dare say anything out of that intolerant tolerant group, it's just like Katie bar the door, the world's coming apart. So we move forward. We have a message. We're not ashamed to tell it. We're not ashamed to speak it. We're not ashamed to say it. We're not, we're not hiding behind little Bibles and crosses and bumper stickers. Well, I'm a believer. I'm not apologizing. I'm excited to be saved. Jesus is coming. Bless the Lord. God's good. I'm a Christian. Well, Brother Joe, you know, why do, we might scare somebody off. Well, you've heard me say it before. Where are you going to scare them off to? Hell number two? <laughs> Amen? No. You move forward with a boldness, with grace. And, and this is what he's telling us. Say, listen, you just need to stand. You say, well, what if they don't listen? Well, they go to the next person. Right? Brother, don't cast your pearls before pigs. Amen? But we don't want to apologize. I can guarantee you there's nobody at your office who lets off a string of filthy words or on your job site who gets up after, oh, I'm so sorry, you're a Christian. <laughs> they do it, it's just second nature, it rolls off their tongues. It ought to be second nature that you bless the Lord. Amen? They bring a curse, we bring a blessing. That's the way it should be, but we're afraid, well, somebody might think, think something awful of us. And you need to get rid of your bad theology. 
That's just thinking, thinking. It's your difference and only your difference that is going to make a difference in their life. It's the uniqueness of your walk and the uniqueness of your life that attracts people to Jesus Christ. And it cannot be manifest without your mouth being in gear. Was it Bill Stafford used to say, most Christians are like the rivers of Alaska, all froze up at the mouth? <laughs> we got to thaw that out and start praising the Lord, start talking about Jesus, start sharing our testimony. Now, some of that bad theology includes stupid statements like this. Well, you know, it's my pastor's job to share the gospel. That's really dumb. I'm trying to be sensitive here. Okay, be, bear with me. Hey, I like it. I don't have a problem with this being my job. You know, I don't have a problem with that at all. But it's my job whether I'm the pastor or not. It's ever, he didn't say in this verse, now you're a chosen race, you're the parole priesthood, you're a holy nation, and you're a people for God's own possession, but only the pastors can proclaim the excellency and be called out of darkness. Well, that's the old priesthood, isn't it? That's the, we're not under the old priesthood anymore. We all share in this blessing. And, and somebody else, here's some more bad theology for you. Well, you know, I just need to know more about the Bible. Well, that may be well be true, but that doesn't, shouldn't stop you. You know? Well, I might not have the answers. You probably won't have all the answers. I don't. You know? And I just, when people say, well, what do you do when you don't have the answers? I say, I, I don't know. <laughs> you say, I don't know. God knows. We'll work it all out eventually. But I believe what, he's, what I do know is true. I mean, what are, what are you going to do about it? Let's, let's take a great illustration from the New Testament. There's a guy in Mark chapter 5. I preached a sermon entitled, The New Dude in the Rude Mood. I've heard that sermon, right? If you haven't, we ought to preach it again soon. It's, it's classic, all right? The New Dude in the Rude Mood is the maniac of the Gadarenes. He's running around just buck naked, all right? And he's slashing himself with stones, and he's cutting himself, and he's howling. Hey, he would probably fit right into the culture in a lot of places in, in Houston today. But anyway, he, he, you know, he, he's mad. Nobody could help him. Nobody could, nobody could set him down and, you know, take the chains and try to help him. He just he rejected all help. He was just living as a madman, completely morally corrupt and insane, until Jesus gets on the scene. And the first thing he does when he sees Jesus, he falls on his face and starts repenting, Right? Now, this guy in Mark chapter 5, if you follow the story through, he comes to, he's, he says, now he's sitting, he's clothed in his right mind, everybody's freaked out because the guy got saved, all right? He's given his heart and life, I'm a follower of Jesus. And so as Jesus is getting in the boat and getting ready to leave the Gadarene coast, the 12 disciples are all getting in and Jesus is getting in and somebody's pushing off. The guy says, hey, 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 wait, I want to go with you. Do you remember the story? Here's the way it reads from the King James, verse 18 and 20. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed to, to the Lord that he might go with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, basically, you can't go. Here's what I want you to do. You go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for you and how he hath had compassion on you. And so he departed and he began to publish in Decapolis, that's the 10 local cities, how great things that Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. This guy doesn't know nothing about the Bible. He's only known Jesus for 10 minutes. I mean, he can't, he's not sitting back and saying, well, I just got to get some theology if I go. I got to have an evangelism explosion course. I got to have Christian witness training course. You know, he just, he said, okay. I <laughs> just got to love this guy. Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. Boom, he heads out and starts telling the major 10 cities in the region. Let me tell you what, God, I, mean, I, was, I was out of my mind. I was the new dude in a rude mood. Jesus changed my life. I'm sitting here with a sane mind, clothed today, my right mind, and I'm going to tell you what God did for me. He didn't have a theology degree. He just had what? An experience with Jesus. What do you need? You need an experience with Christ. You have that you have what you need. No, in other words, well, you know, Brother Joe, people already know the gospel. You heard that one? Listen, there's probably very few people in this nation who know the gospel. A few people in any other time in American history going today, less today, ever before, they're just not going to church. Not interested in church, don't care about church. It, uh, you know, I, you can go through any major mall at Christmas time and talk to people in the mall and ask them what do these Christmas ornaments mean and what does this nativity scene mean if they even have one there. 
and they can't tell you. They can't tell you about the virgin birth. They can't tell you how God selectively chose Mary to, 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 to manifest his son Jesus Christ, the, the perfect man the, who is perfectly God at the same time, who clothed him in human flesh and came and, and represented God to humanity and made a way back to God with his own life. They, they don't know that. They don't understand the gospel. They don't, they don't know the message that God is able. They, 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 and to sit back and to say, you know, that they know everything, that's just ignorance on our part. I mean, even religious people really don't know the gospel, many of them. Well, look, look for instance, in, in John chapter 3, we have the great verse in verse 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, who shall believe in him, not perish. Most people don't know what that is. They see it in the football field, see John three sixteen, But they don't know it. I tell you a good illustration of this is in, in that same chapter, verses 1 through 8, there comes a guy on the scene to talk to Jesus. He wants a personal private interview with him. And he is the most religious man. He's a leader among the most religious elite people in all Judea and Jerusalem. His name is Nicodemus. He doesn't have any idea what's going on. He has no idea. He has got a lot of religion in his head, but he doesn't know the gospel. He doesn't know the power of God. He's sitting asking questions. What does it mean? How does it work? What's, what, how does that happen? He doesn't know. But you know what? I know. You know. You know. And this is the way God has designed it in the day and age. And don't get caught in that little bad theology trap that says, all right, well, you know, people, people have already made their mind up about Jesus. You think so? I don't think so. I don't think they've made their mind up about Jesus because they haven't seen it live before them and they haven't heard it brought to them verbally, what that message really is. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that's the judgment. They don't know that. They don't know they're going to stand before God. Most people in the world you live in and I live in today think that, that their actions are going to get them into heaven if they even believe there's an afterlife. That I'm going to be good enough and I'll be a good person, I'll be a good mom, a good dad, I'll try to be a good parent, I'll try to be a good kid, and there's that big line, I don't want to kill anybody, I won't rob any banks. You know how that goes. So therefore, I'm going to get in heaven. They don't know the gospel. So don't, don't believe that line. And you can simply ask me, has anybody ever told you the gospel? Give me 30 seconds, I'll tell it to you. I mean, I can do it in 30 seconds or less. And you can too if you just sit down to think about it. Here's one of my favorites. Well, Brother Joe, you know, we're just living in that world. People don't want to talk about spiritual things. I don't know what planet you're living on. I mean, go to any bar this weekend. Well, please don't. <laughs> but if you were to go into that bar, if you go in there to witness, that's fine. But if you go in that bar, sooner or later, the discussion is going to turn to God. And it's going to turn to religion. And it's going to turn to spiritual things. Hey, go to hit any stoner's house this weekend. It's going to get there sooner or later. Say, so how do you know that? I've been both. I mean, I played clubs. And it was always, before the night was over, somebody wanted to start a spiritual discussion. And there was usually somebody who wanted to come up to the band and say, can I make a request? And it would be something like this. Do you know how to play the old rugged cross? Can I get a witness here? Has anybody else been in that life? You know what I'm talking about. Amen. Can you play Amazing Grace? People want to know, and they want to talk about spiritual things. Don't believe a lie. You know where all these lies come from? They come straight out of hell because one thing that Satan does not want you to discover is the excitement that happens in your spirit when you start talking about Jesus to somebody. The joy that begins to happen when somebody's life has changed. So first of all, hey, understand who you are. Resolve to stand. And number three is you need to represent the Lord with your actions, all right, as well as your words. There has to be this, this marriage that takes place between your words, your talk, and your walk. If that marriage doesn't take place, you know, he says we are here to proclaim the excellencies. That, and verse 9 there, the idea is there's a proclamation with your life and there's a proclamation with your lips. So your lips have to agree with your life. In fact, in verse 12, if you have it open, it says keep your behavior excellent. He says we're proclaiming in verse 9. He said, but along with, while I'm speaking, he says keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. So that in the very thing in which they slander you, as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds, as they observe your deeds, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, what he's saying, there are going to be people, when you start talking, and you're living your life, and you're walking, they're going to slander you. He said, but the tragedy is that they would slander you and have a right to slander you because your walk does not match your talk. It's nothing worse than being a hypocrite, right? What's the hypocrite? The hypocrite is somebody who's got a good talk, but didn't have a walk. The hypocrite is the one who Jesus completely, continually, over and over again, rebuked 
the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. They put on a face for whatever crowd they were with and whatever they wanted to get out of those people. This manipulation was the, was the role of their life, to manipulate people, to use people. God loves people. He's not out to manipulate people. He's out to change people. And so he said, you know, I mean, what is it? When, when, if, if we were to knock on doors this afternoon and we'd invite people to church, the, the common theme would be this. I'd come down to that church, but if I go to church, I don't go to church because the church is just too full of, of what? This passage says, don't be hypocritical. Because when they slander you, it won't work. And they will slander you. And I believe the more and more we get closer to the coming of Jesus Christ and the darkness of this age continues to get darker and darker, any speck of light that we are in that culture is going to be slandered. You guys are bigoted. You guys are narrow-minded. You guys, you guys, you, you have no love. You just think Christians are the only one who are going to go to heaven. You just think Jesus is the only way. How narrow-minded, how bigoted, how, 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 how racial. That's the way it's going to break down. Because no, if, you have, if you stand for right, they'll label you whatever they can label you. He said, they will slander you. But here's the thing. Jesus told us it would be that way. He said, but what you can do, if you match your walk with your talk, he said, listen, you will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. The word foolish, you know, is it, an interesting word. Because it's what God says, he confounds those people. When he sees... When they see that God is able, doing what he's able to do in your life, you're living it before them, then it confounds them. Verse 16, he kind of follows the same thing. So here's what I want you to do. Act as free men. Live your life what you are. Don't be entangled with bondage. Don't get caught up in their sin. Don't get caught up in their way of life. You stay free. You walk free. You be what God called. Verse 21, he says, For you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. All right? So what? I'm following Jesus. I, I am representing Jesus. If they persecute him, they'll persecute me. So what? Those who received him, hey, they'll receive me. Just, just keep being what God's called you to be. Remember the church, the first century church? Those Christians were identified like this. These are the men who've turned the world upside down. It's time for that again. And that happens when we realize who we are and what God's called us to do. And we understand and we stand and we represent the Lord with our life as well as our lips. And let me tell you, he goes on down. Let me give you two more right here quick. Now, that doesn't mean I'm through. Just hold on. This is going to change people's life around you. He tells them very clearly in verse 17, in the context of being somebody who proclaims actually, he says, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God and honor the king. Respect people. Well, Brother Joe, I just can't have any respect because I just think what they're doing is repulsive. Well, you too were repulsive. Well, I wasn't that repulsive. Hey, repulsive is repulsive. There's no gauges. <laughs> I, just can't, I just can't accept that. I just can't accept that. So I, and you choose, I want to honor that person. Jesus said respect and honor all men. You know what the number one taproot drive of everybody's heart in this whole world is? You You find this in the book of Proverbs and everywhere else in the Bible. People are looking for respect. Most people have the Rodney Dangerfield mentality. If you don't know what that is, ask your grandpa later. Rodney Dangerfield, what did he say? I can't, I can't get no respect. Nobody respects me. I can't get no respect. Everybody around where you work, where you go to school, you know what they're looking for? They're all looking for honor, which is respect. Some people gauge it popularity. Some people call it status, you know, whatever. But basically, they want to be accepted. People want to be accepted. What happens when the church quits being so standoffish, so spiritually narcissistic, like we talked about, they're all proud of what they are, they haven't realized what they've been called to do, and they start honoring people? I mean, people are just starving. Just go down to Walmart, check out, and just show a little honor, show respect to somebody. See how their, their, life, their, their life lights up in that moment. Just that kid in the neighborhood, just that, just that, that person who's an outcast over here, whoever they are, doesn't matter what their lifestyle is, doesn't matter how far they've gone to sin, just show a little honor. Doesn't mean you agree with what they're doing. Doesn't mean you accept what they're doing. But Jesus said he did this for us. How honorable it was for us. When Jesus came, while we were yet sinners and died for us. Just to, just to take this, if all you get out of the sermon today in regard to being an effective witness of Christ is this little nugget, hold on to it. It is transformative. 
in people's lives and the way you reach out to people and the way you care for people and the way you accept people. Just show a little honor. He's, this isn't my words, this is Bible words. Honor how many men? How do I do that? I think you recognize people. You show a little attention. You welcome people. You care for people. You shake hands with people. You smile at people. You don't worry about what they look like, act like, smell like. Don't have to prove them. If God loves them, I ought to love them. If God loves them, I ought to love them because I'm following what he set before me, all right? God's demonstration of how many people just want somebody to reach out and care. I mean, I, I love it when I go eat with my granddaughters. Uh, my four-year-old Elena, she's got this thing she's going through right now that no matter where she goes, when you sit down, uh, if you're, we, we were at Saltgrass and we all met over there to go to dinner not too long ago. So we're all sitting there and the waiter's coming over and she's talking to everybody and, you know, taking orders and everybody's being nice and acceptable. And she said, and, and what would you like? And she said, finally, Elena says, hey, she's four. A little obtrusive like her mother. <laughs> hey, yes, honey, what is it? Is there anything I can pray for you about? Now, last week at Disney World, Cherish told me, that, hey, everywhere she went, she's asking Sleeping Beauty and everybody else, can I pray for you? Is there anything special we pray for you about? <laughs> so, just that alone opens a tremendous door. You know, the mouths of babes, how simple that is. Hey, I'm a believer. I believe in prayer. Can I pray for you? Somebody put in prayer? I, 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 Dr. Nart and Cole eating out with her a lot of times. That she, that's a pattern for her. If you're going to eat with Margaret, she's going to ask the waiter something she can pray for. All right? <laughs> and she'll, she'll, she'll pray. Say, okay, let me pray for you right now. It's just, it's, it's, that's, that's, what that, that's showing honor to people. The fifth thing here is, he said, hey, remember Christ. You know, verse 21, you've been called for this purpose. Christ suffered. He left you this example for you to follow in his steps. That's what it is. He left you an example for you to follow in his steps. It's his example, what he did. These are all the things that he did. He didn't back up. He didn't shut up. He didn't back down. He didn't let up. Even when he's standing at the cross, he's not listening to the accusations. He's just speaking truth whenever he speaks. He's just sharing life and truth. It's his presence. Remember Christ. When you're out there, you're never alone. You remember Christ. When you're speaking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, you remember Christ. Remember what Jesus told Peter? He said, you guys are going to stand before kings. And I'm sure there was kind of stuttering look on their face like, oh, no, we're fishermen. And he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll tell you what to say in that moment. That same principle is as true today for us as it was then for Peter. He'll show you what to say. He'll speak to your heart. But you have to open your mouth. It is so simple, we just overlook it because we're not trained to realize the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. How many opportunities do we just let go by because it feels awkward to us? It's awkward to our old nature, but you wouldn't be feeling it in your spirit. If it's not, if it, you won't be awkward when it happens, when you do it. I mean, listen, uh, my brother got saved about a year before I did, and as soon as he got saved, he tracked me down and started witnessing to me. And he used to come into these, my house and apartment whenever I, you know, I moved a couple times and never told him where I was, but he always found it. <laughs> you know, and he would come in here and I remember one of the first times he came over, he'd probably been saved a couple of months. And he had these little gospel tracts called the Roman Map to Heaven. Y'all ever seen those? And it's basically scriptures out of Romans. And he hasn't, he hadn't, you know, uh, been trained in evangelism. He's given his life to Jesus, won't tell other people about Jesus. So he knocks on the door, he comes in, of course, you know, there's a bunch of people standing around, some are smoking dope, and others are snorting stuff, and others are taking pills, and others are drinking, you know, it's a big party going on. And I ran with a pretty rough crowd. And uh, so he walks in there and says, hey, let me have everybody's attention. I thought, oh, Lord, what's he going to do now? And I'm just over in the corner dying. And he pulls out that little gospel track called The Roman Road. And on it had about five or six little verses from Rome. In fact, let me share with him because these are things that you need to write these verses down and memorize these verses. If you haven't gone through EE or any of those other Christian witness training programs or GROW or some of those other programs we offer occasionally around here, this, this is all you need. You have one, your testimony, right? You, if you have a testimony, raise your hand. He says, you know you got saved. There's a time you gave your life to Jesus, right? You, you've given your life to Christ. So that's, that's the first part. But it's all based upon the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. He would open that little gospel track and say, let me just, let me just I got something I want to read you guys. And he says here, it says right here in Romans 3, 23, it's in the Bible, it says all the sin to come short of the glory of God. Now, what that means is that everybody here is a sinner. 
Anybody here not a sinner? Okay, I didn't think so. Uh, <laughs> everybody sin. And when it means we fall short of the glory of God, we can't get to God. There's no way. We can't work our way to God. We can't be good enough to get to God. There's just no way. He said, then he said, the next verse here is Romans 5, 8. And Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated or showed his love toward us that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That means that, you know, Jesus came and loved you so much that he met your need before you even realized you had it. And that since there's no way to get to God, he came to you and showed you how much he loved you, how much God loves you. So he's given us a way to get to God. He said in the next verse is Romans 6, 23, and it says it very clearly. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here, I understand this. It's pretty simple. He said, if you, if you reject Jesus, there's really no hope of ever getting to God. And the only alternative is hell. Or you can accept Jesus, you know, and realize that he paid the price for your sins. And he has given you this great gift that you can receive by your faith and your commitment to follow Jesus. You just you open it by faith and, hey, you turn your heart to Christ. And he gives you this gift of life. And you can be saved. So you can either pay the price for the way you're living or you can accept this gift and be saved from that price. He said, but next verse is here, it says 9 and 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He said, now simply put, that means that you know you're a sinner. You can't get to God on your own. Jesus came to die for you and paid the price for your sins. He's given you this gift. Now you, here's where you receive it. You trust him. You believe it in your heart. And you say it, say it with your mouth. You confess it. And it starts, it's just a confession of your life now. No longer you're living for yourself. You're living for Jesus. Jesus is Lord of your life. And now understand that when you make that kind of commitment and that kind of confession, the Bible says very clearly in chapter 10, verse 13, that if you call on the name of the Lord like that, God's going to save you. Then say he might. Doesn't say he maybe should. It says he will save you. And I realize he's at the end of the track, and I'm saying, thank you. And then he says something like this. I want everybody to bow their heads. People putting down their drinks and putting down their cigarettes, bowing their heads. You know, I don't think most Christians believe they have that kind of authority. Just exercise it. Now your heads. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you want to do what we've just talked about and give your life to Christ and believe that he saved you, can save you from your sins and give you a new life and take you to heaven when you die, I tell you, why don't you just pray this prayer with me right now? Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please come into my heart and save me from my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I choose to follow you. You're the Lord of my life. I confess it in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's the devil, tell him we're almost through. <laughs> Amen. And then he didn't, he didn't stop there. He said, now, how many of y'all prayed that prayer? Raise your hand. About a dozen people and two or three. He did this about three different times. Raise your hand. He said, that's great, man. And praise God for you guys. I want to talk to you three people back here in Joe's bedroom just for a minute. <laughs> I want to share a little bit more about walking with Jesus. And he'd take him to the back room and pray. Messed up a lot of parties. There's a lot of those stories I could tell you about him coming over when I didn't want him to be there. But praise God, he was. And there may be friends and family like you have that don't want to hear it. But every time you share it, it takes a little deeper root. You can't read the outside of people's hearts and minds. It's not your job. Your job to speak. And let God do the ministry through you that he has for each and every one of us. Now, these are sermons, folks, that you need to understand. These are truths from God's Word. These are not, as I closed my sermon last week saying, this ain't Burger King and Whataburger. These are not for you to be selective over. Say, well, I like that, I don't like that, I want to hear that, I don't want to hear that. This is just the Word of God. It's like, it's like eat, <laughs> partake, let's receive it. Nobody's making this up. There's no manipulation of Bible verses. These are right out of context, right down the line of what these passages are saying. I'm, I, I believe that God holds us accountable. You know, I, I, when I first started preaching, 
there were some pastors that I talked to who after I finished preaching, they kind of felt like I needed to get up and apologize to everybody. I approached at a big conference, a couple thousand preachers there one year, one of the pastors came back and says, I just don't say you can preach like that. I, I was so stupid. I didn't know there's any other way. You know? It, it, it's nothing wrong with holding people accountable. All right? As a pastor, it's my responsibility. But it's never to shame you or to disgrace you into something. It's simply to say, here's the truth. We need to buy into it. This is what the Bible says. Let's embrace it. And let's watch our lives be changed. And let's watch our lives change other lives. Because we're proclaiming the excellency of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. His excellencies. He's the hero of the story. He's who we're talking about. He's the one who's able to change people's lives. How are people going to hear about that? They don't get it by osmosis. It takes more than... I know a lot of people say it's bad theology. Well, my walk speaks for itself. Listen. When your walk is in line, according to the Bible, your mouth is in gear. Does that make sense? When your walk gets in line, your mouth gets in gear. What did they tell the disciples? They said, you guys got to quit talking about Jesus. The Pharisees took him inside and rousted him out, tried to wrinkle him up, mess him up. They said, that's it. You guys can't be talking about Jesus on the streets like that anymore. And what was Peter's response? We can't help it. I can't help it. We need a good case of that. I can't help it. Hallelujah. And maybe today we just need to pray that God would fill us again with his Holy Spirit afresh and anew so that we, we live in that kind of I can't help it mentality. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, thank you for your word. Lord,